Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the press conference with Team Australia ahead of the semifinal against England. Here with me, it's a pleasure to welcome again head coach Tony Gustafson and also with the goalkeeper Mackenzie Arnold. Thank you very much for coming and congratulations for reaching the semifinal. Before we get started then, just a general question to you. What crosses your mind? You know, what is the feeling for being here right now, such an important moment in the competition and how do you prepare for tomorrow? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm quite excited to be honest. Obviously, it's our first semifinal, so it's our first sort of build up um, to a game like this. But um, yeah, we've been really focused on recovery the last couple of days and um, focusing on England. And um, yeah, we're all really excited. Thank you. Coach? Um, well, first of all, you can see there's a lot of people being excited about this game. Look at this room here. <laughs> Need a bigger room, I think. Amazing to see you all here. Um, the players have done a phenomenal job to come down from the emotional highs after the, the quarterfinal. Um, key words was reset and recover. I think they've done that well. Um, we looked at a lot of details in terms of prepping for, for England. We know it's going to be an extremely tough uh, semi-final, but with amazing support from our amazing fans, I think it's going to be a fantastic game. So I'm also very, very excited. Let's open to questions. Uh, please remember to introduce yourselves, um, your name, your organization. Wait for the microphone, and photographers will have five minutes. First question over here, please. <coughs> yeah. Tony, hi, Tom Smithies from Keep Up. Um, can I just get you to look back at some of the experiences in your career and how they'll help you tomorrow night? I mean, you were at Kongsvinger when the club went into bankruptcy. You were at Tirizo when you had players like Marty who weren't being paid. I mean, well, this is, should all be quite straightforward now, shouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you learn from experience in life, especially if you, if you manage a team through crisis. Uh, you learn a lot how to, um, to keep a team together and play for a bigger cost than just your salary. Uh, and I've had the privilege to coach some teams where the why have been bigger th than just being professional in the sense of, of learn, earn a living. They, they want to achieve something more together uh, as a group. And I think this team stands for something much more than 90-minute football as well. So I think that experience can, can definitely ha help in that sense. But then each team, each tournament, each game live their own life. And right now it's just focusing on maximizing the resource in, in this amazing team with the Matildas. Next question over here, please. Yeah, the lady just behind. Hello to you both. Laura from Channel 7. Um, question for you, Mackenzie. Uh, obviously, a lot of um, attention on you since your amazing performance in the last game. I know that you guys shut a lot out, but a lot of memes of brick walls. Um, there's a street in Melbourne that's been renamed after you, as an example. How does that kind of, um, I suppose, appreciation make you feel and also we were having a discussion before about not selling the goalkeeper's kit in merch sales which have gone gangbusters for this tournament. I know that's not a thing unique to just the Matildas now but whether or not you have a response to that. And Tony, one for you, um, starting 11, we've seen you be consistent with that. Uh, is that in your plans for tomorrow night or obviously still want to keep the opposition guessing? I'll go first. Um, yeah, so I, I guess the last couple of days have been a pretty big whirlwind for me. Um, probably the first time I've received attention like that. Um, but at the same time, I just tend to block it out because I know, to be honest, if I play like shit tomorrow, it could be a whole different attention on me. So um, <laughs> I know the good comes with the bad. So I'm just sort of trying to take it in my stride and, um, yeah, sort of trying to block it out a bit um, and focus on the game tomorrow for sure. Uh, when it comes to the lineup, uh, we'll have a discussion tonight again about minutes. Um, I think consistency and chemistry is key for any team uh, that want to be successful in tournaments, and player availability is another one that is key for a team to be successful in a tournament. Uh, I have some tough decisions to make tonight because I have a lot of player availability. Um, so what we do is we look at always trying to start as strong as possible, but finish even stronger, meaning what kind of starting lineup do we want to have, but also what kind of finishing 11 do we want to have, what kind of tool and game changer do we think we need in a game like this. Uh, type of players, uh, whether it's speed or aerial presence or closing out a game. So there'll be some long conversations tonight and some tough decisions to be made because a lot of players deserve to start, but a lot of players also deserve to finish the game and win it for us. Next question right here. Thank you. Yes. My name is Fernando Valeque de Barros. I am Brazilian. I, can, I write for Stade de São Paulo group. Uh, I have a question for both. For you, Tommy, uh, how you feel 
the pressure, how your team are feeling the pressure is an unusual game for Australia. You, you reach a level where no Australian team has arrived until now. How you deal with these new sensations? And to Mackenzie, Mackenzie, you almost killed me last game when you kicked the penalty. <laughs> almost killed myself. Me and I think half of Australia at least. Why you decide to kick? You are a good penalty kicker, and if there are penalty shots tomorrow, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer first and give you some time to marinate on that one. <laughs> oh God! Um, I've, I've said it from day one. Um, we actually don't look at it as pressure. We look at it as a privilege that so many people believe in this team, um, and we feel the support. We feel we're filled with energy every time we, you know, whether it's arriving at the hotel, coming to an airport, going to a stadium, or, or when we play doing games. Um, it's amazing to see how many people support and believe in this team. And in that sense, we look at more as, as fuel and energy than pressure that, that you know, we don't, we don't look at it as heavy. We look at it as we get carried from underneath and built up and, and feel the belief in us. Um, in short term, yes, I am ready if I have to take one tomorrow. Hopefully I don't, but... Um, yeah, I mean, the penalty order was called upon with me in the fifth in the fifth in the line, and um, I wanted to try and do my job for the team. And unfortunately, on that specific uh, instance, I didn't. But um, I always want to do my job for the team. So if it, ha if, it ha if it has to happen again, yes, I will be ready. Time's up now for the photographers. So you can either leave the room or you're welcome to stay. But uh, please uh, don't take pictures anymore. Thank you very much. Next question back there, just just behind. Just behind, please. Yes, thank you. Hi, Tony. Kieran Pender from The Guardian. Um, uh, you, you touched a little bit on player availability, but can we get an injury update? Um, Sam Kerr's calf, uh, Steph Catley's had some strapping, I know. A any update on Kaya Simon as well? Is anyone else we need to be concerned about? Um, not concerned about what we've done is we've focused on recovery. So each player has followed an individual plan between the games. Some have done more football than others. It's all about being as fresh as possible for, for the game tomorrow. When it comes specifically to Sam, um, she pushed through more minutes than we um, hoped for, to be honest. Uh, one of the reasons why we kept her on the bench was that we were uncertain how many minutes she had coming back from, from that calf injury, but also the limited training minutes she had. Uh, the way she pushed through was fantastic and impressive, uh, both from a mental and physical aspect. She recovered well, uh, she trained today, uh, so she's available. It'll be a, a meeting tonight again to see, again, the best starting 11, the best finishing 11, and whether we plan for 90 minutes or plan for an extra time and those type of decisions. So it'll be some tough decisions tonight again, but Sam is definitely available for selection. Oh, sorry, yeah, Steph, same thing, available. Uh, she had a knock, um, patched up a little bit. Some other players did as well, but she's recovered well. Kaya, same thing. She was off feet today, though, uh, like she had done some games prior to the game, so she was off feet in training today, but also available the same way as she was in the last game. Uh, hey, uh, Tony, right here. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Mackenzie Elias Lorai from Valvo Media. Question for Tony, a question for Mackenzie. Um, if someone had told you maybe six months to a year ago that you were going to be in a... World Cup semi-final in your home country, what would you have told them? And Mackenzie, how vital will those 75,000 fans be tomorrow night? Um, I would say to that person, I'm happy that you believe it will as well, because I do. Um, but I'm also going to be humbled to say, we are going to focus on the opening game against Ireland and take it from there. Um, in terms of the crowd, uh, they're going to be massive for us. They've really grown with us throughout this whole tournament. Um, from the first game till the last, it's just grown and grown. And even outside of the stadium, seeing the amount of support that we have um, from all over the country has been absolutely unreal. And they're really like a 12th man out there for us. And I really do believe they've gotten us over the line um, on more times than once. So, um, yeah, they're going to be vital for us tomorrow. OK. Tony, Amanda Shalala, ABC Sport. How have you managed the emotional element of it, such highs, and to now get the team refocused? How have you managed that side of things and to get the team mentally to switch on and focus on this game? We allowed ourselves to feel those emotions for a long time that night. We brought family and friends to the hotel, for example. We also invite all of you and the fans to, to join our circle, so to speak, emotionally for, for a night. 
And then after that, it was all about getting to sleep and recovery. We had a meeting the, the day after on the bus on the way to the airport and say, from now on, every action we do is just about England. How do we help ourselves uh, prepare for England, whether it's mental recovery, physical recovery, tactical insights. And the place has been phenomenal. They're, they're on a mission. Uh, they're not done yet. They want to focus on the next game. Um, training has been good. Focus and meeting has been good. So we're definitely back on track with performance mindset now. OK, next question here. Uh, over here. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Milena Jimón from DirecTV Latin America. Well, this has only been the, th the third time that the host uh, country gets to the semifinals, and only one time uh, the host country win. Uh, so is that a pressure for you, and how do you handle that? Thank you. Go for it. All right. <laughs> I'll try. Um, well, I think this team have shown time after time after time that they are um, willing, ready and able to break down barriers and write history. Um, and if that's one more to, to check, uh, I think the players are ready to do it. But for them, it's, it's more about focusing on, on their own actions and their own game and what they can control. And then the result will take care of itself. So right now, the focus is just on, on one, one action at a time during the game. We know we have an extremely tough challenge in front of us. Uh, but the team that steps off the park tomorrow as a winning team is a team that's going to write history in their own way. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan Tannenwald from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mackenzie, a, a question for you. For those of us who are not from Australia or England, but have heard some things about the dynamic and the rivalry between these two countries. What is tomorrow night going to be like bringing that rivalry to a stage like it's never been on before? I mean, yeah, obviously there's a massive rivalry um, between Australia and England. Um, I mean, with sports all over the place. And that's obviously not going to be no different tomorrow. But um, at the same time, we've got a, a lot of rivalries in football with say, Brazil, USA, New Zealand. So um, I think tomorrow is just going to be another just another game and like Tony said, we're trying to focus on one game at a time um, and really focus on ourselves and our own game plan rather than getting caught up in a rivalry. Hi, um, sorry, oh, sorry over here. Um, Rob Harris from Sky News UK. It's a bit along those themes, but a bit broader. I mean, you and so many Matildas play in England. Everywhere you walk around, there's English related statues and pub names here. Do you get a real sense of that connection between England and Australia? And do, does it give a bit of extra edge? And is it, is it something talked about? Um, not really, to be honest. Um, I'll probably say when I'm, when I'm living over in England, I would see more connection to Australia. But I don't really pick it up over here, obviously, because this is my country. But um, yeah, you, you definitely do see the similarities. But in terms of relating that to the game um, or being talked about, not so much. And you are producing the biggest sporting moments since Kathy Freeman here in 2000. Do you get a real sense of your team's place in the history now of the nation? Yeah, for sure. Like I said before, it's just been an absolute whirlwind, to be honest, for the us uh, since from uh, Saturday night and just seeing the, the way that Australia has reacted to us and um, how everyone's really jumped on board um, and become a part of our success, I think. And, um, yeah, I think there have been a massive reason um, as to why we've been so um, successful and uh, we hope it continues tomorrow night. Cool. Um, hi, David. Here, here you go. Um, Joey Lynch from ESPN. Question for both you, Tony, and you, Mackenzie. Tony, first, I asked you ahead of the Canada game about how the two sides' strengths and the game state would seem to favour Canada, but you overcame that with aplomb. Looking at this game ahead, it almost feels like the circumstances favour Australia. England has a lot of the ball, they get down into the final third, but they have a bit of trouble with that final pass and that final shot outside of the China game, whereas Australia is so good at moving with speed and pace up the field and exploiting gaps in behind. Do you feel as though your side, in terms of the stylistic matchup, has an advantage tomorrow night? And if so, how do you exploit that? And Mackenzie, for you, just coming back to that question about the goalkeeping uh, jerseys, Mary, your opposite number, came out you know, quite strongly in saying that she was disappointed that kids couldn't come out and buy a goalkeeping jersey. And you've inspired a lot of young girls with your performances during this World Cup, young girls and young boys. Would you like them to be able to buy your goalkeeping jersey? I can start. Um, I mean, yeah, for sure. Obviously, it would be really cool um, to see kids or anyone really with um, the goalkeeper jersey on, especially seeing... Um, how well goalkeepers have done um, throughout this whole tournament. Um, in terms of why they don't sell them, I'm not too sure, and I haven't looked too much into it, to be honest. Um, sort of being more focused on the World Cup. Um, but, yeah, in terms of selling them, that would be quite cool in the future, yes. 
terms of the game, I think when we played them last time, I think you're spot on. We got a good transition game going, but I also know that England learned a lot from that game. If you saw England playing um, Nigeria, for example, that is also a very, very good transition team. Uh, England played much more direct than they normally do. Um, so I think they have evolved and adjusted their game plan a little bit, so they're not just possession-based, especially if they choose to play with the back three and two nines that is willing to run in behind. You can see that they play much more direct. Uh, it will be an interesting tactical game in that sense, because is England going to stay true to their possession game, or are they going to take away our transition game by playing a different style of football than they normally do and adjusting in that sense? Uh, we're prepped for both. Uh, we're prepped for both systems, that they can play 4-3 through three and 3-5-2. Three, uh, we've also played three different systems in this World Cup, so we might be flexible and do something different as well. Um, the one thing that I think is interesting is that there's... Some players, no matter what system they play, that have the very same tendencies. And when we played them last time, we managed to target specifically two of those players and benefited from that tactically. Uh, so we looked into those nuances and those individual behavior a little bit more now instead of the system and hope that we can target that tomorrow as well. Uh, Next question. Emma Kemp, Sydney Morning Herald. Question for Tony. Um, just wondering if you had a little bit of insight into what it's like to face a team managed by Serena Wiegmann. Um, you've obviously, you know, Australia played uh, England in April, but you were also on the US side for the last World Cup final. True. <laughs> uh, yeah, brings back memories, of course, from a, from a final. First of all, I have to say, Serena, what a work she's done with every team she's worked with. And there's no coincidence that she's lifted uh, the best, co the best um, prize as the best coach in the world, I think it's three times or so. A very impressive coach, any team she works with. Her stats talk for itself in terms of tournament football. I think she lost only one game, and that's that game that I was lucky enough to sit on the other bench. Um, and then um, I think these players as well, in terms of the England play, not just Serena, but the, some of these players played against us in, in GB when we played them in, in the Olympics, and we were fortunate enough to, to win that one as well. Um, and then the friendly. So that's good, but this game lives in its own life, and she's going to be very prepared with her team like she always is. They're going to have a very, very clear plan of how to hurt us, and we need to be ready for everything that's thrown at us. Vince Rigari, Sydney Morning Herald. Okay. Maka, this is for you. This, this probably goes both ways, but I'm just wondering how useful it is as a goalkeeper to know that the team you're coming up against, you've, you've seen it all before, you play against them week in, week out, you probably know their tendencies, you probably don't even have to go through the tapes to understand that. Um, is that helpful? Does that give you more confidence than a team that might be full of unknowns? Um, yeah, I guess you could say that. I think the friendly that um, we played against them um, earlier in the year was probably a game that um, I was only just coming into the starting team and I think that was the game that I really gained a lot of confidence on and um, sort of bought into the fact that, you know, I am quite familiar with how they play and their tendencies and I think that helped me a lot just to sort of settle the nerves and just, you know, I've, I play against them week in, week out. Um, and, yeah, it's just sort of something that I was used to and, um, yeah, I think, I think you can take a lot of confidence from that for sure. Uh, Mackenzie and Tony Valentina Pena for W Radio Colombia. Uh, this question is for both of you. Um, the penalty shootout against France was the most watched sports event here in Australia since the Sydney Olympics. Um, how do you think this historic participation in the World Cup of you guys, of you girls, can change, uh, can be like a before and an after for women's soccer here in Australia? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I think it's, it's massive. I think um, the legacy that we wanted to leave uh, throughout this World Cup um, to inspire the generation coming through, I think um, we've done more than that. I think we've done more than what we thought that we would accomplish. Um, obviously, we're not done yet, but um, just, again, to see the reaction um, that we've received from the whole country has been absolutely unreal, and I think this is only the beginning, um, and I think there's much more to come. Hello, Mackenzie. Uh, Steve Wilson, HBS, over here. I just want to return to the penalties and the order, if that's okay. It's extremely unusual for a goalkeeper to be one of the five that, that is selected to take a penalty. You might end up taking one later if it goes to sudden death. Whose call is that? And what is your own personal record at taking penalties? <laughs> no, not mine. It wasn't my call. <laughs> wasn't mine either. <laughs> Who told you? 
No. Um, no, it was, we just had the conversation um, before the penalties come up and Tony just mentioned that I would be fifth and that's just how it worked out with the subs. Um, and he, he asked me if I was happy to take it and I said yes. And I mean, I think if it went in, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but unfortunately I didn't. Um, but again, I'm confident enough to take that um, position if that's what I'm called upon. So that's just how it went on the night. Do you have a, do you have a history of scoring penalties? Um, I've definitely taken penalties in the past. Um, in terms of being in the national team, no. Obviously, I haven't played too much um, as a goalkeeper, let alone a penalty taker. So, um, not so much. But in West Ham, um, back in England, I have taken a few. Um, and in previous clubs as well, I have as well, yes. I did make that decision. <laughs> um, it, I can say it was based on all the training we've done. We've done a tremendous amount of preparation for, for PKs, uh, both when it comes to goalkeeper action on the line and timing of that, which Mecca was brilliant at together with Tony and her own work has been brilliant preparation. And when they've taken PKs as well, Maka has been outstanding in training in terms of statistics and the way she strikes the ball. Uh, you can see how good she is with her feet as well and then her mental strength to that. So that was my decision, yes. Next question. Hi, uh, Tony and uh, <coughs> Arnold. So the first one for Tony. Again, uh, talking about Serena. You had the chance to face her in 2019, but you also, and she is the only female coach left in this competition, and you had the chance to work with some of the best female coaches in the women's game. So what did you learn from them, and how did you think uh, is your path from 2019 to, to here? And Arnold, uh, I would like to ask you about the confidence the team uh, has shown in this competition. Uh, it was very clear for everyone who's, who was watching the, the game against France that you looked very confident. You kind of had that look, you know, we're not losing this game. So I would like you to talk about um, how you build up this uh, strong mentality. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, my mentality is something that I've been working on um, for a while, especially um, since I've come into the starting role. Um, and I think that's just really built on each game um, as we pro progress through, um, even from January. I, I remember coming in after the French game, um, the friendly before the World Cup, and we were all in the change room, and Sam said, you know, I, I think this is a time now that we're all really together, and, like, this is the time that we can really believe that we can go all the way because, you know, we've just come off beating England, Spain, France, and all these top teams that maybe we hadn't done in the past. So... I think just everyone's confidence radiating off each other um, and being together and believing in each other, um, no matter who's starting, who's coming on, whatever it is, um, I think that's just really gone a long way um, in the confidence for everyone. Um, I don't think this is a coincidence that most of the team that have won um, a World Cup on the women's side have been coached by a woman. Uh, the stats talk for itself. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount of, of uh, leadership, um, training mythology. Uh, every person you work with, you learn a lot from, uh, which I have done with all the coaches that I work with in the past. Um, in terms of my own journey from, from 19, I think I'd like to go back all the way to 2000 when I started to coach. Um, 24 years of coaching and then started in the women's game in 2012 in the Olympics in, in London. And, being a part of the, the evolution and the development of the women's game and see the growth in quality, investment, all that, whether it's coaching and the coaching quality or whether it's the players, uh, whether it's investment in infrastructure, the, play, the, the clubs, all those things has been an amazing journey. Uh, I'm still learning. I'm far from where I need to be as a coach. I'm learning every single day with decision-making, leadership, training methodology, set play tactics, I'm probably going to learn a lot from tomorrow's game as well. Uh, so if I look back to where I was in 19 and where I'm not now, um, you know my mantra, I want to get one day better every day, not just one day older. And I sit here and be definitely one day older, but I hope I'm one day better as well. Next. It's Mark Schwarzer from Optus Sport. Mackenzie, I'd like to ask you a question. Sorry, Tony, I've asked you all my questions this morning. Um, Mackenzie, you've, you've only just recently been as number one for uh, the Matildas. Just wanted to ask you about how much of an influence and how much of a help has Tony Franken been in that journey for you personally and your development as a goalkeeper and particularly playing in a World Cup considering all the experience he's had? Uh, yeah, he's been massive in my development. I think even, um, of course, on the field but more so off the field. I think when I wasn't um, playing in that starting role and he could see the disappointment um, 
within me. I think he really made sure that I was switched on and I was ready to take my chance when it come, um, which is probably a, something I didn't do um, in the past. And um, yeah, I'm of course really thankful for him um, that I knew that, of course, Tony always believed in me, but just with that working relationship with Tony Frank and obviously it's very different with a goalkeeper um, and goalkeeper coach. And yeah, just to see that, I, I think I could really feel that he wanted me to play. He wanted me to take that chance when it came. And, um, yeah, of course, I want to do it for myself. But, um, yeah, the pride that I see in his face every time I come, come off the field after a good performance is uh, second to none. And um, I'm glad that he's on this journey with me, for sure. Uh, good afternoon, Tom Gary from the Daily Telegraph. Can I ask this question for both of you, please? Um, given the high volume of players in the Matilda squad who play in the Women's Super League, either now or previously, how much stronger do you think the Women's Super League has made this team? I think Mecca that place over there, can, can speak about how much that league and the investment in women's football means for their development. Uh, yeah, uh, I think um, all of us that play over in that league has... We can just say it's a different world, honestly, from coming from the W League over there. And it's just um, the amount of professionalism um, and the talent that they have over there and um, the amount of time that they put into their clubs and players. It just really it really shows within the progress, um, both of them individually and the game as a whole. Um, I think after seeing the Euros and then winning that and seeing how much it really took off and how much money was invested um, over there and... Um, it just really goes to show with the prog progression that they've had over there, for sure. You know, scouting over there, watching training and games and seeing them play week in and, and week out, whether it's a Champions League game, a league game or a FA Cup game, um, it's amazing. Um, the other thing is the, the investment. Uh, they might be a little bit further ahead than us in investing in terms of the money and resources. Um, same comes for the, for the national team. I think someone told me that the women's program in in the women's FA uh, had the same budget as all national team in our FA. It says a lot about the resources and the money that they have. Um, and that, I think, is also contributing to the development of players because it means more full-time staff, it means better training facilities, more resources, more full-time players. So we're on the beginning of that journey, and I hope we sit here in 10 or 20 years from now and say this was a crossroad moment when it comes to investment in women's football, and we can have the same resources and the same money as well. Three final questions here, and then the two of you here first. Right. Caitlin Murray, ESPN. Uh, Tony, this is for you. Uh, you won two Women's World Cups uh, with the United States in 2015 and 2019, two very different roads to winning a World Cup. I'm curious how those experiences have helped you for this moment leading the Matildas, and if there are any specific lessons you took from those tournaments that you've carried with you through this tournament. Definitely. Those experiences um, of extreme value. Um, learning tournament football is very different than week in and week out in the league. I've been a club coach as well, but playing tournaments is completely different. It's about finding a way to win in the game right in front of you. Um, we know playoff games from experience going all the way in tournaments. If you look at, at the games that I was involved with, uh, normally it was a PK, it was extra time or a set play or 1-0 or a 2-1, extreme tight games. Uh, which is going to be tomorrow as well. And all it takes is one moment. I know that from experience. All it takes is one moment. That's why you need to play in every single moment out there, whether it's a defending a set play or you lose the ball in defending transition or whether it's a, a tackle or a one-on-one -one duel. Like that one moment can be the decider whether you win or lose. And you need to live in every single moment because that's how small the margins are in a, in a semifinal or a final. Next one over here, just behind. Um, Anna Harrington from AAP. Question for both. Um, there's been so much discussion over games where you've been the underdog, games where you've been the favourite, um, and where you sit in this. Um, do you consider yourselves the underdog? Do you go into this as equals? Do you? I mean, you won a friendly earlier in the year. How do you, how do you see this? And also, just Tony. Also, you get Caitlin Ford and Steph Catley, who you didn't have last time you played England, and it's been a pretty potent combination. How does that sort of change things? Well, I think our left side in that game was amazing. Charlie's goal, for example, um, when she played. Charlie and Wine was very good in that game, but we've seen Steph and Caitlin in this tournament as well, uh, the chemistry and what they can do on the left side. But I'm comfortable whoever plays on, on that side. Um, in terms of 
favors, favorism and, and who's the favorites, I think I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to, to speculate and write about that. Um, you're much better than me on, on that. That's, that's your expertise. If you look at rankings, they're favorites. If you look at where the players play, they have starting players in top clubs, in top leagues all over the world, not just the 11. They have like 15, 16. And then you compare to us, we have bench players in those teams. Uh, we have players playing in, in A-League. We have players playing in mid-table teams in Sweden. So if you look at all that and you look at resources financially, obviously they are a massive favorite going into this game. Uh, but if you then add the belief we have, but the one thing that we have that don't, they don't have is the support and the belief from the fans. And that itself is going to be massive tomorrow. Okay, final question back there. Mackenzie, and both, both yourselves and England are playing down the rivalry that you were asked about a little earlier. But the truth is these two countries obviously have got a very traditional, long-standing sporting rivalry. I'm sure there's lots of England fans back home who would quite enjoy seeing England knock you out of your own tournament. I'm sure you may have fans and family, family, family who probably feel the opposite way around. But is the idea of being knocked out of this tournament at this stage with the final at stake by England sort of almost unthinkable to you? I mean, being knocked out by anyone is... It's kind of unthinkable. I think, yeah, we would. there's probably a lot of English people that would love to see us knocked out by England, but I think there's more Australians that would love to see England knocked out by us. So um, <laughs> in terms of the rivalry, again, we have such big rivalry, rivalries with so many different countries. So um, it's just another game for us. Um, obviously, England are such a top team, like Tony's been talking about, but um, we've been taking one game at a time and it seems to be working for us so far. So that will be the same tomorrow night. Thank you very much, everyone. Best of luck to the Matildas tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.